Okay, I guess uh, I guess we can start. Uh, Laura, you there? Yes. Hi, Ali. I'm here. All right. So, hi everyone. Uh, we are slowly, slowly moving to the end of this um, virtual conference. So. Uh, Roderick uh, uh, Hodgson is uh, the last but not the least of our keynote. We are actually highly excited about um, the talk he's going to give. It's entitled Preserving Video Truth and Anti Deep Fakes Narrative. Uh, we believe uh, uh, fake media is a very hot topic at the moment. It was one of the focus areas of MMC's 2020, and for sure it will also be. Uh, a, a focus of interest in 2021. So we really hope this talk will be inspiring to many of us. Uh, before uh, giving the, um, uh, be before letting Rod to present uh, and start his keynote, let me just introduce you. It's an honor to have you here at MMC. So thanks uh, for giving the talk. Uh, Roderick, uh, uh, beyond being also, I think one of the winner of our MMC's trivia, uh, is actually a co-founder and VP of Amber Video that is highly focused on uh, showing the truth layer of media and video. He had a degree on artificial intelligence and computer science from Ed uh, University of Edinburgh. After that, he worked at BBC Research and Development Department. He then had leading roles in several startups. Uh, and in the last year, 10 years or decades, he worked on data security, uh, computer security and video engineering. And today he's going to present, to talk about preserving video truth and anti-deep fake narratives. So Rod, I think you are a co-host, so you can already share your slides yeah. and go okay. ahead. Okay, I will do that. The floor is yours. So here we go. Just a second. Okay, how's that? That's perfect. All right, great. Well, thank you, thank you, Laura, for the uh, for the introduction. And um, yeah, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, final keynote for MMCIS twenty twenty. Um, I know you've all been listening to a lot of people talking on their computers over the last uh, four days. So I, I'm really grateful that you're you stuck it out till the end and are listening to me talk for an hour about deepfakes. Uh, it, it is a topic that I am uh, deeply passionate about, as, as I'm sure you'll see. Uh, and I think one of the reasons I'm, um, I'm passionate about it is that it is such a, a unique combination of uh, sciences. There's elements of generative adversarial neural networks, there's elements of AI classification, of video streaming technology, Video codecs, cybersecurity, uh, social sciences, political sciences, all coming together uh, under one one very specific problem. Uh, so hopefully there's something here for for everyone. And uh, yeah, but uh, I suppose science, the science behind it, is not really the only reason that that I have this passion for this subject. Uh, there is also a lot at stake here, um, with you know potentially very lasting implications to society. Uh, some of those implications are are more nuanced than a lot of the perhaps more alarmist articles we've we've been seeing in the press. Uh, so before we get started, I uh, just want to briefly introduce myself. Although I realize the slide is perhaps a little bit redundant now, um, but but just to to reiterate quickly, um, my my background is I'm I'm an engineer. I, I studied artificial intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, when I graduated, I, I really wanted to combine this, uh, this interest I had in AI with another one of my passions, which was video. And so I joined the BBC's uh, research and development department back in, in uh, the uh, mid to late 2000s. And uh, whilst I was there, I worked on a number of different projects, uh, usually like combining AI with video, whether that's content recommendations, feature text, uh, using AI in, in broadcast systems. Um, I was actually reminded from some of the talks uh, earlier uh, during the week, uh, some of the work I was doing in, in computer vision for media production, things like um, uh, free viewpoint rendering, uh, which was the last time I looked at that really was, was 10 years ago. And it's been really fun for me seeing how things have changed and, 
and all the these new ideas around how to do live streaming of free viewpoint rendering for VR and, and all that sort of stuff like the, the talks that, that Ryan Overbeck gave. Um, so this, that's been a lot of fun for me too. Um, so yeah, as, as Laura mentioned, I, I, um, after being at the BBC for, for about four years, I decided I wanted to move into uh, startups and, and sort of worked in a number of them, usually at the some sort of intersection of AI, video technology, and cybersecurity. Uh, but I, I want to tell a, a, a little story, um, something that happened to me back in, in 2016. I went to an event in, in the UK. It was um, a festival called uh, Electromagnetic Field, or EMF. Uh, some of you may, may have heard about it or, or even attended it. Um, it, it's an event, uh, it's a festival where there's hundreds of engineers and researchers that come into an empty field in the middle of the, the countryside in England. And um, it's an opportunity for, for people to showcase some of what they've been working on, some of the research they've been doing, some of their passion projects. It, it's, it's like a little tech city with its own ISP, you know, a three day lasting ISP, a three day lasting MVNO GSM network, a three day power grid all kind of um, as, as the, this background to, to help demonstrate and, and play with all, all sorts of techniques and technologies. And, and it was during this uh, festival that I went to a workshop with a, about 10, 10 people in total. I was about generating art using deep neural networks. And this was, as I said, in 2016. So this was when things like DeepMind and style transfer had just kind of started appearing. And uh, it was before, I guess, the deep fake, uh, or we started seeing deep fakes spread on the internet. I, I think about a year and a half before the deep fake subreddit had, um, had appeared, which I think most people consider to be when, when they started spreading online. And um, it was at this event or at this workshop that I saw for the first time face-to-face uh, -face, uh, being applied. I, I think it, it hadn't even been published yet at that point. Um, but it really struck me, and it's something that stuck with me, uh, the, the sort of the scope of misuse of this type of technology uh, and how, how huge that scope was. Uh, as I said, we hadn't actually seen deepfakes yet at this point, but I, I certainly started asking myself, um, I guess, what role I had or I could have in, in this arena um, as someone who you know, had developed some of these skills around AI and video streaming and so on. Um, what, what was kind of my responsibility here? And uh, it's something that has stuck with me for a while. And then a year later, I met uh, Shamir uh, Alibi, the, the other founder of uh, Amber Video. We were working on a different project. And we realized we actually shared this concern and we saw at the time uh, really the rise in the importance of bystander videos, how important the recordings of, of the deaths of Eric Garner and of Michael Brown were in really catalyzing the Black Lives Matter movement. And I guess at the time we really, we were asking ourselves, would even such a movement be possible in a few years time? Um, you know, when, when deepfakes become so widespread? Uh, and if not, what impact might that have for, for things like social justice? So, I mean, I prepared this, this presentation months ago and it's kind of a bit eerie that uh, I guess this issue has become, or has really come in the forefront again in the last couple of weeks. And um, so I just wanted to, you know, say that, yeah, for me, the question is, is also today how can these sort of things like fake video be used to shift perception on, on some of what we're seeing now and some of the protests and, and has it actually already happened? Uh, so let me take you uh, on a, a bit of a, a journey. Um, I prepared this presentation as kind of an overview in, into the topic. Uh, Ali suggested I, I should consider, I guess, um, uh, an introduction to the topic for those who, who might be interested in, in working or researching some of this area. So that's kind of the main focus of uh, this presentation today, but it's also a little bit about some of the work we've been doing, some of um, our, our findings and, and discoveries and some of our, our innovations. Uh, so um, to start this, uh, first I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about 
uh, how how deep fakes are made. I know that you're probably all very familiar with some of the examples you'll you'll be seeing in a second, but I really wanted to kind of give give a, a structured introduction into this so that we had a we have a common framework, uh, a shared language for us to address the the next two points of my presentation, which is uh, why certainly I think deep fakes are an issue now. And also what, what we can do as, as researchers and engineers to try and address uh, some of this risk. Um, so when we're talking about fake video, there's many different ways we can, we can create fake videos. Um, one of the ways is using artificial intelligence. And one of the ways to use artificial intelligence to create deep fakes is using deep neural networks, uh, generally to synthesize new content, such as faces. When we talk about deep fakes, we're more often than not talking about fake faces, synthesizing fake faces. So it's not the only type of deep fake we can do, but that's generally what people talk about. And if we look at that, we can further subdivide that into two broad uh, types of fakery. One is face replacement, which is rendering someone's face and inserting it into an existing video. And the other one is reenactment, which is the idea of creating a new video kind of from scratch using models of, of someone's representation. Uh, so how, uh, how's that first one done? How do we swap faces? Um, the most popular tool to, to do this is face swap. Um, it's not an algorithm as such. It's more a collection of tools and of open source software. It's, uh, it works as uh, what's called an autocoder which allows it to synthesize new faces based on a model and then merging um, or generating the faces matching a specific pose, um, the pose of the original video, and then superimposing that fake content into the original video. So what's an autocoder and, and how does it work? Uh, well, an autocoder is, is basically just a neural network that can transform data from one representation into a format that is then understood uh, by a neural network and then decoded back into its original format, uh, original data representation. So in the case of uh, pictures and video, we're talking about RGB pixel values being encoded into something like uh, feature vectors in, in the neural network, and then those can then be transferred back out into pixel values. So as a video engineer, I, I kind of like to think about this uh, similar to a DCT or a wavelet transform. Um, it's, uh, you know, so certainly the feature vectors kind of match some of that idea. Uh, when we create an autocoder, when we start off with an autocoder, it uh, is just going to be generating kind of a random blur, but it will learn over time by trying to trying to minimize the, the error between the input data and the output data. Um, so what we can do over time, it will therefore learn this model. And the thing we can do with that is we can actually train it on two faces at the same time, such as Keanu Reeves and my face. And uh, crucially, have the two sets of faces share the same encoder, even though they might have different decoders. Uh, what that means then is that the, the input face representations are, are then using a shared representation in the latent space of the neural network. So if we want to swap one face with another, all we have to do is swap the decoder. Take my input face and then use the decoder for Keanu Reeves. It really is that simple. Um, but it's not all the only thing that face swap does. Um, as I said, it's a collection of tools and it does a number of things um, to try and improve the quality of, of that uh, face swap. Things like uh, matching the skin, co skin tone and, and color of the face, things like edge blurring uh, around the insertion and so on. Um, also, face swap has been around for a few years now. And uh, as I said, it's not a specific algorithm, but um, a collection of tools. So there's actually many different models that exist now. And some of them actually parameterize things like skin tone, et cetera, in the autocoder. So in some cases, you don't even need uh, this kind of post-production effect. So that's face swapping. Um, now, a brief introduction into uh, reenactment. Um, 
I guess the, the kind of the pivotal research in this area was uh, face to face in 2016. Um, which uh, was the first real-time uh, example of, of um, this kind of technique, this reenactment. Uh, the way it works is uh, it's essentially creating a geometry of a, of a source actor and a target actor, and uh, it's mod using this sort of 3D model of both characters with a, a texture applied to them and uh, transferring the expression from one of the 3D models to the other whilst maintaining certain constraints to kind of fit it within the realm of, of possible, the vocabulary of movements of, of the target face. Uh, and then the mouth is handled a little bit differently. Um, there's a lookup table of, of all the mouth shapes and the closest one to the desired target is found and, and what to, to match that. Uh, so that was in 2016. Looking more recently, the same team um, has created a, a more generalized approach uh, called uh, neural rendering, um, and it uses something called neural textures. Uh, this was presented at the last SIGGRAPH, um, so still pretty recent. And uh, the way it works is it's a kind of a similar idea. We're, again, creating a geometry of a particular scene um, and then rendering a, a texture. But uniquely now, the texture is, has certain parameters that exist within the neural network. And the rendering pipeline also has a, a large number of parameters that are part of a a neural network, so the whole the whole pipeline is able to learn, and is designed to uh, to try and fool a, a discriminator. And this lets us do again face you know inserting uh, faces of people, but we can even render them from different angles, uh, different viewpoints. We can add objects, we can remove objects, um, and so on. So beyond just swapping faces, um, there's a few other types of uh, deep fakes uh, that are worth talking about. Uh, one is um, the StyleGAN uh, technique that was uh, developed by NVIDIA, uh, where they, they created, uh, well, they use this to create the website, this person does not exist, uh, which is a website, every time you visit it, it presents you with a new face of a person that simply doesn't exist. Um, it, it, I can show you some examples here. If you haven't seen this before, uh, these are all people that don't exist uh, apart from, I guess, the, the top row here and the leftmost column. All the other faces are combinations of, uh, of the features of uh, the, uh, the people at the top and on the left at different um, sort of varying concentrations. If you still don't see it, have a look at the bottom row here which is um, pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, so the other uh, technique that I think is worth mentioning is deep voice, the creation of fake voices. Um, one of the most interesting papers in this area is um, neural voice cloning with a few samples by the team at Baidu, who are able to recreate someone's voice using uh, as training material only a few seconds worth of video recording. Uh, and finally, I just want to also quickly mention that uh, not all the fakes that we've been seeing online are deep fakes. There's also a new term that's been coined called shallow fakes, which is actually just talking about sort of the more traditional approaches to faking videos. Uh, and uh, as I say, we're, we're still seeing some of these online now. So why are deep fakes an issue now? Uh, I think it's worth first uh, saying that deep fakes are not necessarily used just for malicious purposes. There's a few legitimate um, uses for, for this type of technology. Um, this, this video here um, is uh, the comedian Bill Hader, who does some good impersonations of a variety of famous people. And the YouTuber Control Ship Face created a, a deep fake video where he swaps in the faces of the people he's imitating, like for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger here, into, into the video for great comedic effect. Um, then there's also potential uses in Hollywood. Uh, so, so this is one for all the people who, who managed to spell uh, Mandalorian correctly on Tuesday in the quiz. I was not one of those people, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, we can imagine, um, or oh, we know that in Star Wars, um, several actors were, were sort of revived, uh, such as Peter Cushing and Carrie Fisher um, in, in the films. Though, those weren't using deepfake technologies, but certainly we can see that this is an application 
of this type of technology. Uh, another potential application is internationalization. We, uh, we can imagine it being used for things like dubbing to improve um, the, the visual appearance of, of dubbing using some of the, uh, those techniques where we just saw. Uh, so moving on to malicious uses. I like to divide the malicious uses into two broad categories, which is uh, impersonation, um, impersonating a, a, a famous or well-known person, and uh, the falsification of evidence. So I'll just briefly explain those in turn. Uh, so what are some of the risks of impersonation if we're talking about um, exploiting essentially an appeal to authority? We can make an important figure, a politician say something that they didn't say. Uh, we could also imagine a video of a CEO of a company coming out where the CEO is something, saying something terribly objectionable and this affecting perhaps their share price, only to find out later on that it was a fake video created by, by their main competition. Uh, even if deep fakes are not being used uh, to, to fake politicians, they may still play a role in political disinformation. Uh, there's this video uh, which uh, there, there was a story of the president of Gabon was there a rumor that he had passed away. And then when this video came out of him addressing the nation, uh, a number of people claimed that this was a deep fake. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave you to be the judge of, uh, of whether or not that's an authentic or a fake video. Uh, so that was impersonation. Moving now on to the, the falsification of evidence. Uh, the risks here are, the idea that uh, an attacker could try and blackmail or ransom an individual by creating deep fakes of them, um, you know, fake, creating fakes of them saying something really bad or, or um, uh, doing something bad or pornographic deep fakes of, of a particular individual. Uh, we can imagine an attacker uh, using it as a way to change the outcome of the justice system. Uh, where they could uh, replace the face of someone in CCTV camera footage or in body worn um, you know, police camera footage and so on. Uh, similarly to the issue with the, you know, the example with the president of Gabon, we can also imagine just the mere existence of deep fakes causing um, fake uh, or, or causing uh, video to no longer be uh, as reliable a, a piece of evidence as it normally or historically has been. And finally, there's also, um, you know, what I mentioned before, the, the idea that uh, fake videos may erode the, the value and uh, the power of citizen journalism. And, you know, we've seen the importance of this tool for triggering important conversations, even just in the past few weeks. Uh, so what are some of the trends that are we're thinking about or that we should be concerned about uh, when it comes to, to, you know, these risks? Uh, well, we know that deep fakes are getting cheaper to make and they're increasing in quality. So it makes you know, better revenue, uh, better return on investment for, for the potential attackers. Uh, there's increased automation. We know that one person can create perhaps one convincing deep fake a day, but we know very soon that one person would be able to create thousands of deep fakes, each one of them highly customized to a particular desired audience potentially. Uh, and we also know, um, so the third point distribution, we know that uh, tools like social media will allow distribution of deep fakes uh, at a huge scale and the micro-targeting of audiences, um, including sort of leveraging news feeds and social media bots to try and push virality of, of these types of videos. So uh, at this time, you, you might have a couple of questions for me, which is um, how credible are, are these threat, threats really? And uh, you might have seen this picture before. It's uh, the Cottingley Fairies, uh, one of the first documented cases of photographic fakery. And to us now, it seems almost laughable. I mean, they're, they're clearly cardboard cutouts when, when you see them now. But at the time that they came out, it had, they were incredibly convincing. And we've adapted now to fake photography. So there's an argument that says, well, if we can adapt to fake photography, 
we can adapt to fake video. And that may be true, uh, but we don't know that for sure. And it's certainly a, a pretty big gamble to take to just assume that everyone will learn how to distinguish fake videos. And uh, although I don't have any particular real scientific basis for, for saying this, uh, it is certainly my gut feeling that if a defect video is realistic, it would be more convincing than photography, just by the fact that it's engaging so many more of our, of our senses. Uh, there's also the, the idea uh, that um, even if we know or we're fairly confident that something is fake, it doesn't mean it might not affect us in some way. Uh, I was reminded uh, recently of a study that was done in the 70s where they had uh, participants uh, choose to, to uh, drink some sugar water out of uh, two vials uh, and one of them was labeled poison. And uh, they were told that it wasn't poison, that you know, this, that label wasn't true, that this was sugar, uh, but overwhelmingly the participants would try and avoid the, the, the one labeled poison. Um, to the point that they even had the participants fill in the vials with sugar themselves and to label the vials with the word put to write poison on a, on a label and stick the label on themselves so that they knew that that wasn't true. And even then that they would tend to avoid the, the one labeled poison. Uh, so the, the other question is how urgent are uh, are these threats. Some, some of these deepfakes still seem quite laughable. And uh, I think it's quite interesting when you look at the two main areas uh, that I mentioned, the, um, the impersonation versus um, falsification of evidence. I think that the press has really put a lot of focus on the impersonation um, as, as sort of the, the big threat. And I think we're still a little way away perhaps from being able to convince enough people in a sustained enough way uh, that uh, a particular celebrity has, has said something. I, I think we'll get there, but we might have a little bit of time before we get to that point. But I think for, in terms of falsification of evidence, this is an issue that is very much right at our doorstep. And is something that certainly I believe we need to tackle right now. So how can we do that? Uh, there's really two different ways I think we can try and tackle this, uh, this threat of deep fakes. One is to actually detect um, when a video is, has been altered and when it's a fake. And the other one is to authenticate videos from source. Uh, so the first one, detecting synthetic video, there's uh, a few different tools we can do uh, use for that. But overall, we know that these tools are generating new synthetic content. And so we can use sort of forensic approaches to detect certain patterns or artifacts that are left behind by these algorithms. Uh, one of the things we did was, um, oh, I missed the video. I'll just let it play. <laughs> little promo video we made for, for the work that, that we were doing at the time. There we go. Um, so one of the things we did was we took a off-the-shelf um, AI classifier, ResNet, uh, which uh, was trained to, to distinguish, you know, say this is a human, this is a car, this is a, a dog. And we trained it a step further by saying, this is the face of a real human, this is the face of a fake human. And we found that we had very good results in, in the lab, you know, high 99 percentile results, even testing on, on you know, footage, uh, well, especially testing on footage that, that the AI algorithm had never seen before, content that we had generated ourselves, um, fakes that, that uh, we had shared between uh, our colleagues in academia and industry. Uh, but then when we tried to apply that, that algorithm to some of the videos we had downloaded off of YouTube that had a lot of um, you know, high quality post-production and, and um, uh, had you know, really looked very, very professional and seamless, uh, it stopped being quite as accurate. So we, we kind of abandoned that particular approach, but um, 
there's certainly been some more work since then, because this was a couple of years ago. So I'd point you to the Face Forensic++ uh, work that was done by the same people who made, um, who worked on face-to-face -face and who worked on uh, the neural rendering pipeline. Uh, and they, they managed to find uh, very good results, even with videos that have done through all sorts of transcoding processes, um, certainly results that outperformed a human classifier. So what are some of the other approaches we can do? Um, well, we can look, instead of just looking at deep fakes, we can try and detect more generally any kind of splicing um, alteration that has happened in video. Uh, this has the added benefit of detecting shallow fakes as well. Uh, we can do things like identifying uh, some of the inconsistencies in the, the data itself. Um, so I'd point you to some of the research uh, made at the University of Naples, such as SpliceBuster, as uh, some of the, uh, the key work in this area uh, that's looking at uh, noise residuals. And there's also some um, much older technology that we can continue to use in, in this area, such as DCT coefficient differences and, and JPEG artifacts. Um, beyond just looking at the data, we can also try and build some models around uh, the cameras and the recording equipment that was used. Um, so uh, by, <clears throat> again, the University of Naples is the uh, camera noise print technology. Um, that, that's been, um, there's some work around that. Um, we can look at things like the inconsistencies in lens aberration, inconsistencies in things like focal length, um, in the color filter array of the individual cameras. Uh, then we can also look at uh, some algorithms trying to detect specific deep fake uh, mechanisms. So there's uh, work around things like looking at inconsistent head poses or um, things like blink rate detection or even you know, modeling the behavior of particular uh, celebrities and, and trying to detect the, the inconsistencies in, in their behavior. Uh, one of the tools that we developed and spent a lot of time on was uh, detecting the specific post-processing operations that were applied by the software libraries themselves. Uh, so we know, or we could clearly see the, the blurring uh, algorithm, the, um, uh, the hue shifting algorithm that was being applied as post-production effect to the face swap. And so we could, uh, and we knew where those were being applied uh, relative to sort of eye position and so on. Uh, so we could try and reverse engineer that and, and detect those particular uh, algorithms being applied. Uh, but overall, we, we certainly found some challenges and I'd summarize those as saying um, there were, uh, you know, videos that have a high production value that have post-production or, or additional VFX applied uh, would often hide some of the, uh, the signals we're looking for. Um, any sort of transcoding runs the risk of uh, removing or hiding some of the, the uh, patterns that we're looking for. And of course, ultimately, it is uh, an arms race. We're, we're talking about things like generative adversarial neural networks. They, they're able to uh, optimize based on you know, minimizing an error function. Once a detection algorithm is known and, and published and documented, they can use that as part of the error function and try and minimize the chance of it being picked up by these algorithms. Uh, and I mean, we, we do believe still um, that detection is a valid approach. It's a good sort of short to midterm approach. Um, but even then, it, it is obviously imperfect and it's more suited for what, what we know now um, the known knowns and, and not so much uh, suited for, for the unknowns in terms of the future of deep fakes. So this really is the only durable solution, um, what we like to call building a TLS for video. And this is all about solutions around multimedia systems, around sort of the, the, the VOD, systems that, that exist. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about authentication? Well, we know how to authenticate documents. Um, we can hash a document and uh, store that hash somewhere safe, such as a, a, a blockchain ledger, as has become quite popular recently. And uh, when that document is then consumed, it can be downloaded, rehashed, and the hashes can be compared. Um, 
certainly we've seen a lot of this kind of approach and things like contracts. Uh, but unlike contracts, um, videos tend to be edited uh, during the distribution process. And so this type of approach of hashing files themselves uh, doesn't really lend itself well to, to, to video. For example, if we have a five hour long piece of uh, body worn camera footage and um, two minutes of that is used in a video with some logos prepended to it, uh, some some additional um, sort of cutaways to other content, the hashing of that final edited file is completely going to is going to be completely different from the original. So what what can we do? Um, so what we did is we had a look at hashing each individual uh, block of data, so each individual frame, um, video frame, each individual audio packet. And then um, taking these these hash function, these these fingerprints and arranging them in a tree-like structure. Uh, you might be familiar with these kind of trees of hashes, these hashes of hashes. If uh, you've looked into things like uh, Merkle trees and blockchain, uh, the idea being that if one of the hashes change, uh, you get an error propagating to the top, but the rest of the tree is unchanged, and so you know where the error was and that the rest of the data is unaltered. Of course, this approach works quite well if you're mutating data. But when we're talking about video, um, video data, we're generally talking about content being spliced and new content being appended, inserted, and so on. So if you imagine the, 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 you know, the bottom left one here being a, uh, say, GOP that's being removed, then the entire tree gets realigned and all of the hashes, the entire tree gets invalidated. So the inventive step that we came up with to address this problem uh, was the idea of using the hash values themselves as boundaries for building this tree. Uh, we would apply a modular function on the hash values. So say, for example, modulo six would give us a result of zero on average every six frames, every six blocks. Or if you did module 30, you'd have it on average every 30 blocks. So you could target a desired hash duration um, and it would center around that point. You'd get some shorter, shorter hash duration and, and, and some longer ones. The idea being that uh, we would make a hash of hashes based on the boundaries defined by the output the value zero in this function. And this gives us a tree like uh, a hierarchy of hashes that are in, invariant to pre-pending data, invariant to post-pending, invariant to, to trimming, uh, to insertion, and, and so on. Uh, so how does that look in, in practice? Uh, so we can imagine a news organization attending a speech and uh, filming that speech they're recording the content on a camera. Uh, the camera is hashing the, the video data in real time, signing the hashes with the device key and storing those in some sort of trusted database, such as the blockchain. Then the news organization comes back to the editing desk. They, they edit the recording, trim it, add content as required. They store a reference to the original hashes in the metadata of the file, and then they publish it to a platform. And then finally, the consumer goes to the platform and retrieves a video, retrieves the hashes, validates the signature on the hashes, uh, rehashes the content that is being streamed to them, and validate that content as authentic. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, we, we built a mobile app that allows users to record video and to hash it. We built a, uh, an online tool to edit the videos in, in a variety of ways and trimming and splicing and so on. And we built a playback tool that allows the user to see the, the history of, of the file, the hashes, what the previous version of that particular video was and that chain of custody essentially. Uh, so it looks something like this. This is, um, if you've not seen this video before, the uh, comedian and film director Jordan Peele made a fake, made a fake, a deep fake with BuzzFeed, uh, where uh, because he does a good impersonation of Barack Obama, 
uh, he uh, said, said a bunch of things that Barack Obama would never say, and they had the deep fake of Barack Obama saying those. And uh, we took the original video that this was based off of and then spliced in the fake content. And then when you play it back, uh, you can see when it switches to the fake, uh, we, the, the user gets a warning that um, this video can no longer be confirmed as authentic to the original recording. Uh, so, so our goal here in building this, this sort of platform was not to, you know, not to be the next YouTube or the next Twitch or anything like that, but really to show how this type of technology can work and to demonstrate how, how it can work in practice. Uh, but really, this sort of approach would need to be taken and integrated into um, a multimedia platform directly. Uh, so, um, really, authentication is the durable solution to, to deep fakes uh, and to digital integrity as a whole. Uh, it's not something that I think we would need to see on all videos, uh, on all streaming platforms, etc. Uh, but just uh, certainly, at least for the vid videos of criticality, uh, the ones that um, are important in, in the context I, um, I presented, uh, these, these potential misuses um, of uh, video of, of representing people and so on. So there's three things I'd like to leave you with. Um, three things, three sort of further areas of work, or I suppose you could think of them as, as, as three challenges almost, um, which is how do we integrate? Uh, so I know I, I said uh, authentication is the, the durable solution to this, but I do still think detection does have a role to play in, um, in these systems. And how can we integrate uh, some of the detection technology in existing video on demand systems and in existing multimedia systems? Uh, the other question is, uh, how can we efficiently and effectively have a system for platforms to share knowledge about deep fakes in, in a secure and accurate way, uh, in a real time way, uh, as, as these videos spread virally? And finally, how can we uh, define a common framework for that sort of you know, durable authentication of video? Uh, you've heard our approach now, uh, and um, it tackles some of the urgent use cases, but I, I know it's just the start, and um, yeah, I very much welcome your thoughts. Thank you. Wow. All right. Thank you so much for this uh, talk. Uh, uh, it was uh, certainly very informative for me. And yeah, uh, very welcome. like we have lots of questions, uh, uh, Roderick. Okay. So let's see. Uh, let me open up the questions and then uh, we can. All right. Du -du 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 -du. Okay, you should be able to see the questions. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, ha, you stole my joke, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we, we start with the top question and then we go uh, one by one. All right. Okay. okay, so shall we need an anti fake program like an antivirus program in the future? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a, a very interesting analogy. Um, I, I see detection to be a very similar kind of approach to antiviruses. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about the, the two sort of solutions I talked talk about, detection and authentication. Authentication is more like TLS. It's more like having, you know, certificate authorities in your browser. Um, but detection is a lot more like having um, an antivirus in that it's, you know, it might be able to catch the, the script kitty equivalent of a deep fake, um, but maybe not uh, one created by, by a more um, competent um, attacker. Uh, in terms of whether this is something that would need to be installed on, on people's, um, uh, people's uh, computers, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess um, it could be something, I don't know where in the, in the delivery chain it needs to live. 
if it's something that can be done on the platform level, if it's something that should be done in the browser, um, I'm not too sure. I think my gut feeling is at least to start with, it, it should be, it'll be closer to, to the platform. It wouldn't be close to the content creation. It will be somewhere, somewhere in the delivery chain rather than necessarily at the end user's uh, point. But um, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I'd like to think about that some more. Could, should we do it directly on, on the end user o over the, the, um, the distributor? Hmm. Yep, thank you. Okay, second question was from me. How do we know that this uh, keynote was actually a real one or it was just a fake video? Well, you don't, that's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, I never met you, so that's another thing. I mean, that's uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Am I, uh, am I someone from the this person does not exist.com site? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question uh, The blockchains, uh, can they even prevent, uh, can they prevent uh, distributing fake content? Um, well, it depends. It depends what you mean. I mean, in my view, the blockchain, when we're talking about blockchain, it's, it's an expensive place to store data, generally speaking, uh, which is why at least we came up with this idea of storing hashes. And then we had you know, to, to address the problem of, well, how do you make a good hash of a, of a video uh, that you know, would, would work in, in these kind of scenarios? Um, so I think the main challenge with blockchain is that you don't want to store too much data on there. Uh, you don't, you don't want to ideally do things like, uh, transcoding on the blockchain, even though that would give you a pretty, um, good assurance that, that the, uh, the transcoding was unaltered and so on. Um, it's, it's not, it, it would be far too expensive, at least at, at the moment. Uh, so the, the way I think we need to apply blockchain is um, in, in storing small bits of information that we can correlate with the original data. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a, I guess it's just a, once you have a hammer, you start seeing everything as a nail. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, blockchain yeah. is so popular now. Okay. Uh, the next question is also about uh, watermarking uh, or steganography. Uh, can we use them to prevent uh, fake videos? Uh, well, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think in, in my view, the main role of uh, say, for example, watermarking is, in, uh, is not necessarily improving that the video was unaltered. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, how can I explain this? It, it's, um, we, we want to know for sure if even one pixel of the video has been changed, right? And so watermarking is not going to give you that assurance. I think right. where, where things like steganography and watermarking can come into play in this is that it might be a really interesting and efficient way of storing, um, uh, so the fingerprints of the data itself. So maybe if you do a, a hash per frame, there's some way you could embed the actual hash value within a watermark somehow, uh, something like that. I, uh, I'll, I'll leave that as a challenge for someone to think about, um, but certainly it's an interesting, an interesting approach. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I really like the next question. Uh, so Stefano is asking, where does the concept of deep fake stop? AR, you know, my face filters are becoming a normality right now, but they are still in their infancy. So, you know, I mean, in the next few years, they might get really much better. And uh, so, I mean, is our understanding or definition for a deep fake media or video image uh, will change over time uh, hmm. with the improvements in technology, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess it, it might become a, sort of a semantic question of whether we should call something a deep fake if it's not using a deep neural network. Um, but um, certainly, I, I think all, any, any sort of technique that can be used to falsify 
something about a person uh, is maybe how we should be using the term deep fake and should be what we see as, as the risk as opposed to, um, you know, if, if someone's using a filter to make uh, to make their, I don't know, their dog appear more cute, that, that might not necessarily be part of the same problem space that, that we're talking about. Um, so I think, yeah, may, maybe that term is is not the best term. Deepfake is not the, the best term in the, going forwards and that we should think about um, how any kind of uh, video editing can be used to misrepresent people in and and how that technology can be leveraged at a scale that that makes it both convincing and you know highly automated and and that's what we should be thinking as a threat all right thank you so babak is asking uh, you know uh, what are the good use cases for deep uh, uh, and fake media it's uh, i mean we are just talking about this bad use but uh, there must be or probably there are some good use cases for this technology as well uh yeah i, I mean it's a good it's a good question because i haven't really thought what what might be the the most exciting use of deep fakes um i'd say and this is probably a deeply personal um opinion but um i'd love to see it being used in in uh, for accessibility in many different ways i mean i mentioned things like dubbing um, how that can make content accessible to, to many more people in, in a way that, that is uh, perhaps easier uh, for, for certain people to consume, uh, how maybe it can be, it can be used for um, you know, an educational tool uh, to be more engaging um, w for people with certain neurological um, you know, disabilities, uh, things like that, I guess, yeah. Yeah, we should uh, we should probably spend some time on these questions. I mean, these are really uh, not very quick. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and be quick in my answers. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, Jesus' question was quite similar, so I'm skipping that. Uh, okay. Uh, the video quality evaluation. So, um, what can we use uh, to test the quality of uh, fake media? Um. Or is, I mean, is there sorry, any, I might be is there any metric, for example, like, oh, this is really a nice fake, or this is really a bad fake? I mean, obviously, we can, uh, we can, I mean, it's not just about the quality of the image or the video, yeah. but really, yeah. oh, you know, you can fake uh, that many people with this uh, media mm. or not that many people with this media. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you know what? I, I don't actually know of a, a well known metric. For measuring how convincing a fake is, I'd, I'd never, I'd never even thought of that actually. It's um, like a fake meter, you know, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly you could measure against how how well it's able to fool uh, some of the the detection algorithms, so like fake forensic plus plus and so on. Um, of course, because it's it's such a subjective thing, and and it's still quite an early. Um, or, or the detection of deepfakes is still fairly early um, stage work. I think you'd be better off using using a, a you know human based objective evaluation. But um, yeah, if if anyone knows of a well known and and uh, popular um, measure uh, for this, I'd love to hear about it because I, I realize I, I don't know of any actually. So yeah, good well, question. No, I might uh, I might have a. You know, uh, directed to uh, Hadi's question a bit differently, but uh, he's also asking whether there's any ground truth detector, like uh, you know, the ultimate uh, test device or test algorithm for uh, deep fakes. Now, I mean, uh, do we have something available today that people can actually use, test, maybe try to improve? Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think the. The state of the art in, in detection at the moment is probably going to be face forensic plus plus, I would say. Yeah. Hadi, you want to add anything? Yes, if it's possible, just I want to ask my question again. The thing is that, you know, in, in uh, evaluating quality of compressed video, for example, we ask mm -hmm. subjects to come and score the quality of video. Yep. But here, 
are human and subjects good enough to detect the to detect the uh, fakeness of the video or not? What would uh, be the answers, you know, or we should yeah. use the computers or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I the truth is I, I don't know the answer to to that question. I um, what I do know is that face forensic plus plus again is. Um, according to the results, outperforms human classifiers. So perhaps that's what we, we should be using. Um, but, uh, but again, it's it outperforms human classifiers, um, whether it can uh, detect some of you know, the, the fakes that might come out tomorrow is, is another question. I mean, I think this is part of the problem is that there's still so many unknowns and it's so, so rapidly changing that having something as reliable as a, as a sort of a ground truth measurement is is going to be very difficult at least at, at present um, if that makes sense does that does that answer your question yeah i guess uh, he's muted now but uh, oh. i hope it does <laughs> all right uh, okay another question uh, great talk uh, most cannot spot uh, manipulated images i assume that's also good goes for the fake videos so uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, photos, uh, media ethics discourage violations. But uh, what about the deep fakes? I mean, uh, whose responsibility is it to you know, <laughs> uh, discourage the violations? I guess. Yeah, that is a very good. Question. I suppose there are not really many laws around this yet, right? I mean, um, okay, correct. Yeah, and, and and I think there's even currently there's still a debate whether there even should be laws or if it should be sort of a self-regulated space uh, and it becomes a bit of a political conversation i mean i can tell you what my opinion is on on this matter because i i know a lot of people say uh oh it should be a system-wide responsibility it should be shared between the content creators the editors between the the distribution between the uh, you know the the, the platforms the uh, consumption platforms and so on i would tend to disagree um, the reason but, being, but, uh, remember, uh, President Trump uh, just a few weeks ago he passed a law. Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. Executive order. I don't know what. what uh, that yeah, is. the executive order. Yeah. Think that social media companies are responsible for what goes around in their platforms, right? So, yes. I mean, how come Facebook or Twitter or uh, any other social media can actually follow and uh, check whether everything is authentic? It's, uh, you know, preserving confidentiality or privacy, you know, I mean, all those kinds of things, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty tough requirement in my opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and as, as, as the question says, and as you say, who should the responsibility lie with? Uh, I mean, uh, certainly, you know, say, say a news organization trying to release a video uh, they've they've got their you know their own limitations in their budgets and things like that. It's not necessarily going to be cheap trying to to prevent these deep fakes and trying to do even the best effort at trying to prevent deep fakes. Should they have the responsibility as as sort of the content creators? Should the distribution platforms, you know, the broadcasters and so on, should they have a responsibility? Um, I I think what needs to happen is there's going to need to be some level of regulation, and that's going to happen on an international scale. And I know that there's many people in this space that disagree with me, so you know take the, that with a pinch of salt. But I don't think that we can rely on things like uh, you know the odds, maybe maybe the occasional funded project and and so on to to protect something as vital as our information networks going forwards. Uh, we can't have, you know, an occasional, a few bits and pieces here, uh, you know, a, a software tool here and there. There needs to be strong and coordinated action and there needs to be someone who is legally liable for a spread of um, something, if, if it's a known fake, uh, who that responsibility lies with is, is a, a little bit of a tougher question for me to answer. Um, but uh, yeah, that's 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 my take on the issue. But it's a divisive one, and I know it's a, quite a political one as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. One last question. Uh, that's from Karsten, and uh, he is asking about the third dimension, like three D representations. Uh, is it already possible to fake in three D? Uh, yes. 
<laughs> yes. to that question. So um, the best example of that is the um, one of the, the papers I was referencing, which is um, neural rendering um, by uh, Thies et al, which, which is um, the team, I think the department led by Matthias Niesner at the University of Munich. I want to say, um, and so so that neural rendering is is viewpoint independent, and um, I mean I can I I can play play a video of it through my computer if, if you want me to, um, or we can do it in in you know the the breakout after this um, after this talk if you prefer. Yeah, once uh, we close, you know, we have the awards and the closing session. Yeah, uh, you know, That's we will hang it out yeah. here, so you can you can certainly play whatever you feel like playing. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Roderick, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to you so much. I mean, it's, uh, this was an incredible uh, talk. This was very well, informative. You. Lots of useful information uh, to see what's happening uh, in the field at the moment. Yeah. I feel like this is still pretty early. So maybe we will invite you again next year to see what has <laughs> <laughs> what has happened in the last well, year? Well, I, I also remember I, I, I've, I've won a prize, right? Yeah, yeah, you do. You do. You do. <laughs> Actually, we are gonna, yeah, we are gonna, we are gonna give you one right, right now. And uh, thanks again. A virtual applause for our uh, speaker. And uh, we directly move to our closing 